Welcome to what's new and contributing to Microsoft Learn. This is about GitHub. It's about Microsoft open source docs, and it's about your career. Uh, I hope you have been a great Fabric Global Conference so far. Thanks for joining us today. If you're watching the recording, I hope you enjoy this as well. My name is William Asif. I work for Microsoft on the database docs team, and I'm responsible for a lot of Fabric documentation, especially around data warehouse, and I've worked on a lot of the Copilot documentation as well. So. This is your opportunity to ask anything you have questions about for documentation, as far as how to contribute to them via open source pull requests on GitHub and a lot more. So go ahead and get started. So here's today's agenda. We're gonna talk about how to contribute to the open source docs as code on GitHub, including for Fabric, but really this applies to everything inside Microsoft and what you need to do to become a contributor to the docs. First thing you need is a github.com account. If you don't have one already, easy to get set up, it's all free. Uh, then you can get involved. You can give us feedback, and if you find them, you can give us corrections and edits to the docs that the entire community uses. You might find this rewarding for your career, impressive to your boss. Uh, it might find this rewarding to your MVP activity reports if you're going for MVP, if you're going for MVP renewal, uh, or your personal brand, your blog, so forth and so on. Throughout this presentation, again, we have the Q&A feature uploaded. I'll stop periodically to answer questions. I'd be happy to have a more conversational thing. It doesn't look like you can uh, come off a of mute or video, but please put in your questions at any time. I'd be happy to respond. Okay, so on the database docs team that I work on at Microsoft, we work with the product groups and program managers for everything SQL Server, um, everything um, uh, Fabric, everything uh, involving all the SQL Server flavors inside of Azure and Fabric as well. We also cover content for data platform tooling like Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, and other tools. And we're called the Database Docs team because we also cover the open source Azure databases like MySQL, MariaDB, and Postgres, as well as Cosmos DB as well. But we're just one content team. And uh, while today I'm going to be throwing in some data platform specific stuff um, because of, I, I hope I know my audience a little bit. Uh, this presentation is all about Microsoft Docs and all Microsoft technologies. I know we're Fabric here, so we're all data people, so I'm gonna throw in some nuggets for us though. So Microsoft Docs are not Wikipedia. It's not open to edits, but we do have hundreds of thousands of articles and we want to embrace the wisdom of you in the technical user community to help us maintain a high level of quality. Opening the docs up to external contributors is part of how we scale. So keep all these ideas in mind for ways to contribute um, and, and how we could get contribute, uh, how you can get contribution credit as well. And again, all this stuff looks really good in your Microsoft MVP activity report. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the Microsoft MVP program, uh, but I would say that stuff like this that we're talking about today, contributions to documentation, is looked at qualitatively, not quantitatively. Typos, grammar, stuff like that uh, is unlikely to be as helpful as, you know, significant technical content, fixes, corrections, missing content, stuff like that. Okay, so how can you contribute? So you can contribute to Microsoft Q&A. Uh, I think everybody's seen that kind of thing. It's pretty new. Fabric has a really good presence there. Uh, you can create and share learn collections. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. There's a UI feature in all of Docs you may not be aware of. You can create and then socialize public collections in Learn. So a collection is where you can gather up all these Docs uh, in Learn, all these Learn modules, Q&A answers from over in that site, and also external links on a topic. You can put them all in one collection. Then this can be shared publicly. You can mention this in your social media or in a, your blog as all part of a recommended learning solution for you uh, to, to curate and share with others. Uh, maybe you've been working on a problem, you've been working on a project or a certification exam, something like that. You could put all your resources together. Um, this is also just introduced. You can uh, create a plan uh, of existing modules, uh, learn modules, uh, and assemble them together. For example, there is lots of learn training needed for a given job or a project or a certification. You can put together a learning plan that others can sign up for and track their own progress through built-in reporting functionality and email notifications. So as a manager or a team lead, you could assign learn modules in a custom way and then track your team's progress. Already, there's a lot of official Microsoft developed learning plans for a variety of career paths on the Learn site. If you go to the career paths area in Microsoft Learn. And so finally, what we're talking about today though, how you'd interact with me and the rest of the database docs team is contributing to open source docs on GitHub. So what kind of articles 
am I talking about that you could contribute to on Learn? Well, just about all of them, but take this as a call to action. Um, if you see an article that has notes or cautions or maybe needs a note or a caution or an important or a tip tag, you can see those colorful boxes that we put in the articles. As long as they're not overused and there's some science to that I could talk about, uh, these are a great ad to really call the customer's attention to something. Or you could try to add or expand uh, sample scripts, perhaps with a helpful comment in the code or an explanation here or there. Uh, finally, another call to action, FAQ articles, frequently asked questions articles, have a lot of kind of usually random bits of information, oftentimes about interoperability between other products, uh, availability, stuff like that. These are great places for you, uh, external to Microsoft, to help add content here that would be helpful to everyone. So a lot more information uh, I have to share today. I'm going through some quick stuff, but like, why? Why would you want to contribute to Microsoft Docs? Uh, to Microsoft Learn, right? So one, to prevent mistakes with your own lessons learned, uh, to prevent mistakes from yourself from going back and doing this thing in, in a year or two and you've forgotten. Um, this is really useful to the community, right? You could share with everybody and make everybody's experience better. Show your manager contributions to the product area in your career, perhaps demonstrate leadership in a technical area. If you're a consultant, Show your clients, hey, I contributed to this article. There's my GitHub name right there. Um, you can learn more about the internal benefits for you and your career. Um, you can get to know the uh, content developers like myself or the program managers for the product of your area of expertise in whatever fabric workload maybe you use the most. You could be a resource to them. I know my favorite external contributors through their GitHub contributions, usually by name. Uh, you can help establish your own personal brand for MVP recognition. As I talked about, I'm not going to really talk about the MVP program a whole lot today. I'm happy to answer any questions as I can. Um, but you, but uh, you can establish this personal brand as a contributor, if not an expert in your area. And then finally, uh, inside Learn, uh, th that's kind of the, the, the thing inside Microsoft that creates all this documentation content, the Learn modules, the training modules, things like that. Inside Learn, we have a team that has started uh, a series of contributor spotlights where we interview folks who are external to Microsoft or they're in like support orgs in the field in Microsoft who have been going above and beyond to contribute for Microsoft Docs. So, for example, here are some uh, on the Azure Developer Community blog that Microsoft has been publishing regular spotlight articles based on interviews with contributors, both internal and external to Microsoft, whose primary job responsibility Primary job responsibilities are not to work on docs like, like mine is. For example, escalation engineers or cloud advocates in the field or MVPs or folks who are looking to become MVPs. These are public blogs. They're boosted on LinkedIn. It's just one more way that we like to encourage and reward contributions to docs to, to learn content. These spotlights are nominated by folks like me, the same folks who would review and sign off on your pull request as well. And this would be a very nice item to add to your MVP activity report for sure. Okay, enough about that. Let's talk about Microsoft Docs and how you use them. I'm not going to spend, I'm going to go real quick. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time because I think many of you are probably familiar with Microsoft Docs, but uh, I'm not going to explain every like UI element here, but just to give you a map about navigating specific docs, some of the features that we have without explaining every button. Uh, so uh, I'm going to zoom in a couple things here. Uh, this little cluster of buttons on the top right-hand corner is new. The plus button allows you to save links to collections that I mentioned earlier to organize all your docs, all your Q&A stuff, all your learn, all your external links as well into one place for a specific project or a problem or a certification exam. You can save these docs to a collection then alongside your Microsoft Learn modules and then socialize those as well. You can uh, then use this feedback tool right here. Let's uh, talk about a couple things. The feedback button brings you to the submit immediate feedback about an article. This is in the form of a, a thumbs up and thumbs down and then a text box. This is what we call a verbatim feedback. It's a one way, it's anonymized. So we don't know who you are when you send stuff like this. Still be nice, please. Um, but yeah, this is one way that we can accept real quick feedback on an article. I'm gonna talk about a better way and that our preferred way to receive feedback next. So that pencil button is the first place to get started. This helps you start a new pull request. And that's something I wanna talk about in detail shortly. And I'm gonna walk you through how to do it. But William, I don't know how to do a pull request. I don't even know what a pull request is. That's okay. I'm a former DBA. A lot of DBAs, we're not familiar with source control pull requests, GitHub, Git, and things like that. You don't have to be. What I'm talking about today, how to contribute to Learn Docs, is all through the website, all through github.com. There's nothing to download or install. I'll get you there. Okay, moving on. 
Uh, some uh, resources on the side. These are automatically generated by uh, AI on the right. Uh, we have two search boxes I want to showcase. Uh, first, top right, searches through the entire technology stack you're in. For example, all of Azure. And from the results page, you can then search for all docs. Over here, this only searches in the TOC and it only searches by the title of the TOC. This actually can be more convenient if you know the name of the article that you're looking for, uh, the name of the system object, for example. And it's more convenient maybe than a wider scoped search. This is in the SQL docs, and you're going to see some UI elements here that you may not see in other places. Um, uh, this isn't one of them. In the center of the first page of the article, you can see that mini table of contents. That's to all the H2s, the heading twos in the markdown. Uh, you'll see this. Uh, all over the place, and this applies to Article, especially for SQL Server references, because we have so many different flavors of SQL Server. You'll also see this in Fabric Data Warehouse, where we have both the warehouse and the SQL endpoint. Some articles appeal to both, some are just for one or the other. But you'll see that applies to line at the top with a hyperlink to each product title that kind of explains what's going on. So um, let's keep going. The other thing I want to show is each of these headings in the article is linkable directly. If you want to send a colleague a link to a heading specifically deep within a very tall article, you can hover over the heading. You can see that little link graphic appear, copy the URL with the page anchor appended. So you can see what we're talking about here, the uh, the little anchor button, and then you can see it appends the, uh, you know, the anchor link. This is typical HTML stuff, right? Uh, and then finally, uh, at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the download PDF option. You may have seen some communication that this feature was going away in the past. We heard some really good feedback from the community about how these PDFs are consumed for offline or remote use. And so we're delaying that feature retirement. We do have some a different system coming for offloading, um, for downloading offline docs uh, soon though. So watch for some new uh, features in that space. And then, hey, why not let's talk about this article. This is what's new in Azure SQL Database. There's also a tremendous, uh, a, a rather large, what's new in Fabric article. If you're not familiar with that, the what's new in Fabric article at learn.microsoft.com is a fantastic resource for you. It has a couple really good important features in this what's new article. First is it tells you what's in preview and what's generally available. This is really important to some customers who do not allow preview features in production. Not everybody, but it may be really important for you. And that is an authoritative place where you can go and find out what's still in preview as far as like features go, stuff like that. Fabric itself, of course, is generally available, not in preview anymore. The other thing it does is it breaks down that what's new in Fabric one, similar to what's here, it breaks down on a monthly basis what's been going on in each, but Fabric does it by workload. So you can see, hey, what's the newest stuff that's just come out in Data Warehouse? In Synapse Data Warehouse, that workload. What's the newest stuff that's come out in Data Factory for Fabric? You can go see that. If you're an MVP or you want to become an MVP or if you're a content creator of anything like that, that's great fodder for you. Let's go talk about what's new, right? Um, it links to the blog. You can get more information. It also links to the docs. So this is triangle between the docs, the blog, and the what's new page where we should have lots of links going back and forth. These what's new pages are great for inspiring your own social media, your own blogging, and your own, most importantly, your own learning. So if you're a technical blogger, the what's new page for various services in Azure. We also have what's new in Azure SQL Manage Instance. We have what's new in Azure SQL VM. We have what's new in Data Factory. We have what's new in Power BI. What's new in Fabric, obviously. We have a lot of what's new pages. These are a gold mine for your own learning and for your own content inspiration. Okay. Uh, let's talk more about, uh, I'm not going to talk about this right now for Fabric. This is mostly a SQL Server thing. Uh, we'll keep going. And versioning is mostly a SQL Server thing too. Okay. If you have any questions about that stuff, if you, if you are a SQL Server DBA like me, I'd be happy to go back to them. But in the interest of time, I just want to point out, everybody can contribute to Microsoft Docs. So we have a step-by-step -step tutorial here to guide you through the process of creating a pull request. So if you get anything I say, if you forget everything I say in this presentation, learn.microsoft.com slash contribute is going to have everything that you need to get started. I'm going to walk you through it today because it's fun for me. Uh, but uh, everything you need here if you're watching a recording or if you want to look back at this later on. And by contributing to Microsoft Docs for any product or technology, you can be part of the community and help edit docs that everyone uses. And we're going to talk about that contributor designation. I'm going to show you how you can get your GitHub name and picture added to the top of an article. We average like 150 million page views a month. That's not a small amount. So that's a decent amount of exposure. And if you want, again, you can do this entirely within the browser. There's nothing to download, nothing to install. You do not have to install your own local repository in Git and clone a repo or anything like that. You can do all that 
If you're a developer and you know how to do Git, you know how to clone a repo and things like that, you can do all that with the Microsoft open source repositories. I'll talk about those. Otherwise, github.com kind of takes everything, takes care of everything for you and gives you nice green buttons to click and really just kind of follow the green buttons all along. All you really need is a free github.com account. I'm gonna walk you through it right now. I'll show you how easy it is. First, you should really enable uh, two-factor authentication in your GitHub account. Uh, this is required for most corporate repositories. If you have a GitHub account for work use, you really should have two-factor authentication on. And uh, I recommend not using only your phone or your phone's app for this. I recently had a Microsoft colleague of mine, an engineer, lose his phone, and then he got a new one, and then he found himself uh, unable to access his GitHub account. Definitely recommend not just using your phone number, not just using an app, um, especially the phone number stuff for like texting. The SIM swap apps are a very common vector for bypassing multi-factor authentication. You don't want to be the weak link there. A hardware key with backup copies of that hardware key or some other method besides, you know, that expensive commodity that's in all of our pockets is probably a better choice. And then regardless of your method for multi-factor authentication, make sure you download and save your two-factor authentication recovery codes. These are like one-time codes that you get. Take this seriously. Put this in one place. If you have two-factor authentication and you don't remember where you put those TFA codes, you can download them again. If you lose your device, if you don't have your recovery codes, you will lose access to your account. It cannot be recovered for you. This Backup codes, for example, could have saved that Microsoft engineer I mentioned a lot of time when he lost his phone. And you can access your backup recovery codes in your GitHub account settings under account security. Okay, enough of a public service announcement about that. Did you know that GitHub has dark mode? Let's talk about fun, important stuff. Did you know that there's a couple ways to change your theme in GitHub? There's a couple different versions of dark mode you can pick. I'm a dark mode enthusiast. I can't see your hands. Maybe you can if I raise them. If Can, can you raise your hands right now if you're a dark mode enthusiast like I am? Any reactions there? A couple ways to change your theme in GitHub and the appearance menu. There we go. We got a dark mode enthusiast, Amanda. Uh, including having it automatically sync to your Chrome or Windows appearance settings for night and day. Uh, I promise I won't talk too long about dark mode, but I am. If you're an enthusiast for dark mode websites like Amanda and I, uh, learn.microsoft.com has a dark theme too. So check out the footer of any doc in the website. Change your theme to dark mode. It's also arrived in uh, Microsoft Word. I hear it's coming to LinkedIn. We have it in uh, Power BI. We have it in all the Office apps. There's LinkedIn, right? Um, uh, we have it in Teams. We have it in Word. We have it in Excel. We even have it in the Xbox Game Pass page. You can have dark mode. Love it. Love dark mode. All right. Enough about dark mode. Sorry. Uh, to be clear, support issues do not belong in documentation feedback. So what we're talking about today, documentation feedback, especially pull requests, not for support, right? The feedback options do not have uh, SLA or response time or, or in some cases, any response at all. If you're having trouble, if you're having a problem, you have an unexpected behavior or an outage or an error message and you need help troubleshooting, contact Microsoft support or your support partner. Doc, um, this doc uh, is about, um, uh, what we're talking about here is about uh, feature support. Um, we're talking about uh, supporting the documentation. If you have feature ideas, um, this is not necessarily the best place for those either. Uh, we, uh, we, we have a, a public feedback. I'll show you the link to that, right? So um, for product ideas and product feedback, like, hey, I think the product should do this or should do this differently, feedback.azure.com. Uh, there's one for SQL. There's one for Fabric as well. Right, uh, lots of fabric ideas you can see, and you can upvote other people's ideas as well. So, for um, uh, what we're talking about today, though, we're not talking about uh, support feedback. We're not talking about product issues. We triage this incoming feedback. We triage pull requests from GitHub. And if it sounds like a support issue, your issue will likely be closed up with a polite message and some links. Um, in terms of product feedback, you might have remembered the connect systems or the user voice systems of the past. Those have been replaced as of a year or two ago uh, with feedback.azure.com. Most of the old ideas have been migrated, although for GDPR and some privacy purposes, the, com the comments from external users um, and the names of external users have been removed when those product ideas were migrated. So um, docs feedback that gets attention, the stuff that we're looking for, 
is a request to fix something missing or outdated or wrong in the docs, not in the UI, but in the docs, or to add something that would have helped prevent an error or an outage. That's really good stuff. Those are the kind of things that get attention. And um, we talked about the verbatim thing uh, where you can give like a thumbs up and thumbs down. There's a text box. We would much rather receive a pull request, which is at least the start of an idea to how to improve a doc, how to improve something in the documentation. It doesn't have to be a complete thing. I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. So you found something in the documentation that's out of date or wrong or missing and you'd like to add it and you want to suggest the edits yourself. You can click on the pencil button here, top right-hand corner, showed you this. This is just another article right here. The pencil button top right. Uh, you'll get to GitHub. If it's your first time doing it, there may be a big green button to fork the repo. You don't really have to understand what that does. Just hit the big green button. That'll only happen once. Then you'll get to this page, which is the Markdown preview page. Um, this is uh, the GitHub flavored Markdown preview of the contents itself. Click the pencil button again. So again, two pencil buttons is really all you've taken to get to this, which is the actual Markdown code in a text edit box. May or may not surprise you to learn that Microsoft Docs are not maintained in Microsoft Word, but rather they are maintained in code. Uh, this is in Markdown and some Docs are in YAML. So Markdown is a lightweight, text markup language created for formatting rich text with a plain text editor. So this is a plain text editor. GitHub has their own formal implementation of Markdown that we also use for docs called GitHub Flavored Markdown. But many different online sites use Markdown for their content, including uh, like GitLab, Reddit, Stack Exchange, Bitbucket, Drupal, and a lot more. You may be more familiar with Markdown than you think already. Make your changes here in the text box. Go find the text, go add some text. If you're not familiar with Markdown, you can, you can see it's, it's just the text. It's pretty easy to understand uh, once you get rolling. And again, don't worry about it being perfect. You're at least starting the idea of something getting improved in the doc. The content team, somebody like me, will always review your content submission and potentially tweak it to Microsoft standards before it's merged live. There are plenty of resources online about the basics of Markdown syntax. Uh, you shouldn't need it. Again, if you don't see something quite right as far as formatting, bold, italics, stuff like that, a link, don't, don't sweat it. Okay, uh, once you've done, uh, big green button. This is a theme in GitHub, big green button to commit your changes. You can propose your changes by committing them to a branch um, and you can get a description in the pop-up window, enter a pull request. Uh, the default is fine. Uh, it will be public, so make it nice and informative. If you're not familiar with GitHub terminology like pull requests and commits, um, again, don't worry. You don't have to be. You're hitting big green buttons here. We'll take it from here uh, and we'll keep you updated because what you do right here is it creates a pull request. Your changes in the markdown of the file will be proposed for merge. They'll be triaged. They'll be reviewed by multiple humans. Um, including the article's author and reviewers. Uh, the content team for the article will take it from here. Uh, they will reply to the PR in comments. We'll make further edits if necessary. And eventually we'll decide on whether or not to merge your changes. And you'll be notified along the way with feedback directly from one of us on the content team. Again, you can do all of this through your own tooling if you wanna create your own fork, branch, commits, uh, push, and then create a pull request in GitHub. Uh, that's what I do on the content team every day. Uh, but if you just want to use github.com as a website to handle the entire process for you, it's actually much easier. Okay, so your pull request will be assigned to human reviewers. Human and automated messages from the build engine will appear in the conversation tab. And then use the files change tab of a pull request to review it line by line. I'm going to show you this right now. Here's what it looks like after you've submitted a pull request. First, you can see some automated systems kicking in adding metadata and some tags, and automatically assigning some Microsoft staff. Human authors and reviewers will be assigned and notified, and both human and automated messages will appear here. You can see this blue arrow that I've added pointing to the commit itself. That's the actual commit, the set of changes from the branch. Now, if you scroll down, you can see another commit. You can have multiple commits in a branch. That's easy. You can see with the two blue arrows here, Kendra has added two commits to this branch. Two commits show up in the conversation tab. A branch can include many commits, and a pull request is simply a relationship between two branches. In this case, it's your branch and Microsoft's branch. So how do you go about adding another commit if you want to? Let's look at a couple of ways to do this. The first, if you just click on this, which is the name of your branch, 
you'll be added to, you, you'll you'll see all of the files in the branch and then you can go find the file you want to add you can even edit multiple files or the same file more than once you can add files although it's typically not necessary for you to add files we're mostly looking for feedback from uh, existing articles your PR will start in open status. Let's look at one that's already merged, which means it's been accepted, and soon it will be merged into the live production repository, usually within a day. Um, this was an excellent pull request worth showing off. You can see what GitHub did uh, was automatically create a uh, fork and automatically create a branch in that fork for you. In this case, it's just in the user's name and then patch one. It just counts up from there. The pull request includes a commit, red arrow right there, which is in the uh, pull request log in the conversation right there. There's the actual commit, right? Then uh, down at the bottom, let's see some other stuff. The pull request log contains automated and manually created messages, automation from the merge engines, other commits, conversation. There's one from me. Eventually, someone on the content team like me will review and maybe make some edits, maybe sign off on that change and have it merged, and you'll see those comments too. You'll receive an email anytime someone uses your username with the at symbol, and you can respond in conversation here at the bottom with a comment button as well. And again, the big green button to talk back. So this is the files change tab. Uh, once it's created, you can see exactly what you have changed. I would look at this to see exactly what you are proposing to add or change in the article. This file change tab shows the in-browser differential. Red is the old, green is the new, and you can see that the changed characters are highlighted. Pretty easy to understand. If you're not used to seeing things side by side, GitHub has another way to do that. In the gearbox right here, you can switch from um, the split to the unified, and then you can see the changes stacked like this, one on top of each other. Um, here you can see that um, some updates to make a sentence clear, these are welcome. Perhaps a sentence didn't translate well or, or was unclear or vague, needed to be more specific. This was a good edit. If you're trying to describe how something should change, Simply using the feedback thing to say, hey, this is wrong, change this, or in the third paragraph in the, this page, in the second sentence, you know, that's difficult to do. Maybe just show, don't tell. Simply making the change yourself here in a pull request is much easier than trying to describe your contribution. Again, if you want to make more changes to the file, here's another way to do it. You can create another commit to the pull request simply by clicking on those three dots, and then you click on edit, and then you're editing the same file over again. Hit the big green button again to make another commit. Uh, and as soon as you are done, like, hey, we'll take it from there. It'll be included in the same pull request and we'll review. There's even um, there's even more interactive collaborative way to contribute to pull requests here. Let's show this. I wanna show this off because GitHub introduced this only in the past year or two. These in-browser suggestions are a really easy way to continue to collaborate in a pull request on somebody else's pull request or on your own. We do this internally between docs and product and engineering teams at Microsoft. Um, minor edits, like we talked about before, minor edits can be suggested entirely within the browser. In an existing pull request that's already in progress, you can make a comment and then hit that little plus minus button to suggest changes in the browser in line. So here's a GIF walking through the example. I'll let it loop a couple times. So now you're editing the line or lines by using that blue plus button at the start. So you watch for this blue plus button that hovers over. There you go, see that? Hit that blue plus button. And now you're editing the line or lines that you've selected. You can submit this change uh, to the author with a single comment. You can describe what you're doing and you can continue to collaborate all at once. And here's using the blue plus button to edit more than one line at a time. You can kind of click and drag. Now you're adding more than one line with that plus minus button. This is all really easy to do. You could use this internally. You can use this anywhere in GitHub, including for contributions to Microsoft Docs. Cool. Eventually, someone, usually the content developer or the author of the article, somebody like me, will write pound sign off in the pull request comments. You'll see that. Um, it's not something you can do. It's only something we can do uh, with our automation. That sign off comment starts a process behind the scenes. More information shows up in the PR log. If it's small enough and if it qualifies based on a few different criteria, it might just quickly and automatically merge into the branch from there. Other times it would require another human reviewer before it goes out the door. Commonly, depending on the amount of change, some other factors, uh, that human reviewer could look for non-technical things like compliance and style, stuff like that. Then once it's merged, the docs will be published live, usually twice a day. In the case of Fabric, we publish three times a day because we have a worldwide team. Um, the ex exact timing varies, but you can look to see something about an hour later based on uh, content delivery networks and stuff like that.
And then here's the credit where credit is due. If you've contributed via a pull request and we merge your commit into the doc, you'll get mentioned in the contributors pop-up at the top of every article. You can go ahead and see uh, everybody's GitHub profile picks and names. The folks listed here are both inside and external to Microsoft who have submitted comments to an article. So it's worth mentioning that if you start a pull request, even if we close it, we might bring your commits internally into a different pull request and your commits would still be uh, published eventually there. Uh, we usually let you know if we're going to close your pull request, but we're still going to use your commit. Also, these contributions, again, can be part of your MVP application or MVP renewal activity. Though a fair warning that these are, again, qualitative, not quantitative. We're not looking for commas or stuff like that. We're looking for actual technical contributions. Uh, they are examined for quality. Um, I don't really have any more information about the MVP program, but if you have any questions about that, I could give it a shot. Okay, let's do some tips on uh, contribution and why we want you to contribute. Uh, if you're not sure how it should change, but you know, like something's missing here, we gotta say something. You don't know how quite to say it, right? You don't know how to speak Microsoft Docs, no problem. Uh, if it's not formatted perfectly, no problem. If you're not sure how it should change, just give it a shot and get the ball rolling. Call attention to it in the best way possible, and that is with a pull request, like what we're talking about here. So here's some other notes to ease your anxiety, put you at ease, get you started contributing to the docs. So for images, graphics, and charts, we have designers. We used to get images updated in a standardized way. There's no need to edit images yourself. You could make suggestions to the image uh, in text or in like the alt text or something like that to draw attention to that. And that's okay, we can still use that in a commit. Um, capitalization is tough, uh, SpongeBob font. The capitalization of various features and products inside Microsoft is one of the more nuanced bits there is about publishing. Uh, marketing usually wins. Marketing always wins these arguments, regardless of how products documentation evolved throughout the development process internally before it goes public. Um, we sometimes get pull requests that come through to make a lot of capitalization changes. Um, sometimes these are well-intended, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're misguided. This task is tricky enough when you have information directly from the inside sources. Um, so typically we try to handle that part of the docs well enough. Yes, if you spot inconsistencies between marketing and documentation content and training content, um, feel free to point those out. We are working on that regularly. Don't be afraid to point something like that out. But just on product names and capitalization, this is like one of the trickiest things, uh, especially when a generic word is part of the product name. So just because we have a product called Azure SQL Database doesn't mean that every word database is now capitalized, right? Um, as your functions uh, versus a function, right? It, we still have generic terms of databases and functions. Try to remember that when you go to taco time, you order a lowercase taco, not an uppercase taco every time. If you're not from the Pacific Northwest in the United States, taco time is a fast food restaurant that serves tacos um, that are uh, special because they have no flavor. They have absolutely no flavor at all. Uh, you have to add gallons of spice just to get anything out of these tacos. Uh, coming from Louisiana, which is the part of the United States, if you're not familiar, Louisiana is the part of the United States that has um, flavor. And so when you go to taco time up here and you're from Louisiana, it's just no good. You have to add a lot of spice to it. Anyway, it, it explains the metaphor here about tacos. Capitalization is even more difficult for international partners and our customers, uh, because capitalization often means that a product or service name shouldn't be translated or should be translated in a specific way. Uh, but the lowercase common noun of the same term should be translated. So translation is difficult enough, right? It's important that we get this stuff right. Inconsistency and capitalization could confuse translators and customers around the world. So we want to get that right. Uh, let's talk more a little bit about uh, uh, international stuff and trans translation issues as well. And then I'm going to give you feedback on how to, I'm going to give you information on how to provide translation feedback as well. But when it comes to comments and code, uh, those are great. Everybody knows they should comment their code, right? But code comments are not translated. So a doc must explain what a code snippet is doing outside of the code comment. If you see code that isn't properly commented, or if you see code that isn't properly explained outside of the code block, that's a good pull request. You could help contribute and make the docs better for everyone in all languages by contributing a better explanation and better comments to a code snippet. So that's helpful too. I mentioned code snippets as a call to action at the beginning. But look, when it comes to grammar, when it comes to style, when it comes to capitalization, translation, 
code comments, everything else that we've talked about. Remember that the core goal of our brand voice is to above all be simple and human. We don't want to be too informal or cute. We want to use common words. Uh, we want to stay away from jargon or extremely technical terms or academic terms, even if they're accurate. Technically accurate is still not approachable in many ways. So let's make sure we're writing docs that are helpful and approachable. So if we can do that in any kind of way, that's another way you could contribute. Let us know. Okay. Uh, information about localization issues, such as a translation issue in our localized versions. If you've got a translation issue to raise, those are submitted through this Microsoft 365 form. So submit your feedback in any language using this form. It will be translated and routed to the correct team. Uh, and then per the localization team, the feedback is usually triaged within 24 hours. And if it's a valid fix, a fix will be implemented in one to two weeks. If you've got a technical issue with an article, and you're most comfortable submitting your feedback in another language besides English, no problem. Instead of creating a pull request in English, you can use the same form. It will be translated and passed along to the proper content team like my, my team. Either way, thanks for contributing and making Microsoft Docs better for everyone, everywhere. So again, that link is AKAMS provide dash feedback. That is for translation feedback across the board. Okay. Now you've seen how we want you to use GitHub to contribute to docs. You've seen how to create a pull request. I wanna show you some inside baseball to talk about how we use GitHub to host Microsoft documentation and how we use this docs as code approach to publish docs. So again, most Microsoft docs are edited in Markdown. We spend most of our time using Visual Studio Code or Azure Data Studio to edit docs. We have other tools to help with things like automated link checking, uh, syntax formatting, uh, formatting, bulk updates, uh, and we have a series of include files to tokenize things like product names or important paragraphs. We have a rich set of metadata for each article, and we do pay attention to how articles perform in terms of search engine optimization and traffic patterns and trends, all driven through uh, Microsoft Fabric, actually, on the back end. All of this is um, to try to improve poorly performing articles or articles that aren't uh, linking through. If you have a, a exit rate, something like that, if you're familiar with any kind of SEO metrics, we look at all that stuff on docs too. And we use many metrics to track the performance of an article, including for example, if you copy text from the article, that's good, we like to see that. If you click through, scroll, dwell, those same kind of metrics that any website these days uses to measure how effective a web page is without capturing any personal information or wider tracking information. Most of our decisions about docs and doc layouts are data-driven. The doc UI stuff that I was showing earlier, that was all data-driven decisions. And when we're data-driven, we can make better uh, decisions to, about engagement, uh, about how to make more useful docs, and we try to follow that lead. So for big article updates, we have systems to handle things like release branches for when we want to work on documentation for months and months at a time, and then release it all at once during the keynote at Build or Ignite. Uh, many of these strategies are not far off from what developers use to release software patches all at once, where you got to get all your changes together and then you release an update. Uh, we use the same tools. Happy to answer any questions about that, uh, but moving on to some basics of GitHub. So this is a behind the scenes diagram. I'm going to explain it in more detail of how Microsoft Docs works in GitHub. Uh, and GitHub is where all Microsoft documentation is hosted and managed. And if you are new to Git and you don't understand this, don't worry. As I have explained um, to contributors in the community like you, all this is managed for you and it's easy to do, easy to do inside of a single website, github.com. But here's the basic workflow and kind of what GitHub is doing for you on the back end in Git. So a repository uh, like Fabric Docs or Azure Docs or SQL Docs, we have a lot of repositories, is where the source is housed and where the website engine pulls Markdown to present you live docs in the website, right? Where it actually gets the doc. There's a whole engine that translates the markdown. It's something that looks like a nice Microsoft doc. A fork is a copy of that repository associated to your account in GitHub in the cloud. We each have created forks of the repo in our own GitHub accounts on my team. As, as soon as you start interacting with a repository for the first time, GitHub will also create a fork for you associated with your account. This is created for you in GitHub with a single click of that big green button the first time you need it. To tell the two apart, the Microsoft's version of the code versus your version of the code in your fork, a common convention is to reference your remote fork as origin 
and the code base you eventually need to push to as upstream. These are just um, these are just standards defaults. You could actually name your remotes anything, and these are called remotes or remote names. Um, you will have an origin and an upstream for each repository that you work in. Then a clone is a copy of your fork downloaded locally to your workstation. The files are copied to your workstation so that you can make edits. When you work entirely within github.com, this is all managed for you in the cloud. Nothing is actually downloaded or installed. When you go to make changes to a file or to add or remove files, you'll create a working branch that is relevant only to the chunk of changes that you'll be making. And you want to have many branches if you have many things going on at the same time, because you don't want one fix to be held up by another fix if there's a delay with that or something. You want a branch to contain only the changes to a specific feature or issue that you're addressing so that it can be treated as an atomic block of changes as it goes back up the stream. So your work goes into this branch. And here the branch is called you know, number uh, fix issue where that number is an ISO date appended to the front. Uh, the ISO date sorts really well. Uh, when you're done, first you commit to your branch locally, to your own clone of your workstation. And you have done some work here, but GitHub has no idea that you've done anything and neither does Microsoft. So then you push your branch and all the commits to it from your local workstation to your origin in GitHub, your fork in github.com, the fork of the code. Now, GitHub has their changes, has your code, but Microsoft still has no idea that you've done anything yet. Then you create a pull request. A pull request is a comparison between two branches, your branch and Microsoft's branch. Here you ask the Microsoft Docs repository branch to accept commits from your branch so that your changes can be merged in from your fork to the repo's main branch. And that's as easy as it works. Again, you can do this entirely within GitHub. If you're doing it locally, I've kind of worked you through how just Git works in general with GitHub. Now, to get it a little more complicated, to make things a little closer to the reality of how we work internally, we actually have two repositories in the Microsoft Docs account for every repository. The Azure Docs repository, um, or the, pub, uh, the Fabric Docs repository, the SQL Docs repository lives and drives the website. But like true professionals, we do not develop against production. We only develop in a preview repository, so Azure Docs-PR or Fabric Docs-PR. Uh, this is not visible to the public, don't worry, you can't see it. This allows us to work in and preview the merged state of our changes in an actual live repository with a test version of our engine running against it, so we can see what the stock will actually look like when it goes live. This build process to the live website to go from the preview repository to the public one is again two or three times a day, and it's gated by this team of build reviewers. But when you submit pull requests, you don't have to worry about that. You all, all everything you do operates inside the public repository. Your workflow and all the validation necessary occurs inside the public Fabric Docs repo or Azure Docs repo or SQL Docs repo. And again, this same Docs as code pattern applies to every Microsoft technology, every Microsoft Doc uh, for every Microsoft product. So if there's any questions about this, again, the Q&A feature is open. We'd be happy to chat. There is a lot of resources here on you can learn more about Git and GitHub. Uh, again, you can contribute to GitHub through github.com entirely in the browser with nothing to download or install. But if you'd like to get more understanding about how to do this, if you have a development background, if you're looking to become a developer, this is really good stuff to pick up to learn about Git and GitHub. And here's some great resources here for Microsoft Learn. Okay, this is the part of the presentation at the very end where I talk about just new stuff that you may not have picked up in Learn. I'm gonna briefly show you some of uh, some new information. So AI is a hot topic, everybody's talking about AI. So some important news here. If you use AI to write content that you contribute to Microsoft, we need to know about that. If we use AI to write content for Microsoft, we need to be public about that, to be honest and ethical about that. Um, we add a metadata tag to an article to properly and ethically acknowledge this. This is already live. It's not optional for us. Um, there's a link right down here. You can click this link right now because I'm using the PowerPoint Live feature of Teams. Um, this is an example of uh, a, uh, an AI-generated content that was reviewed by a human and then published, including code samples. Uh, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions on this, but moving on in the interest of time. 
uh, you can have multiple Learn accounts associated with your Learn profile. This is especially useful. I found it because I had changed emails since I was a student to a professional. I had changed jobs and had different emails for each job. So you can combine all of these different experiences that you've had over the years in your Learn profile uh, with multiple email accounts. To, and now your Learn profile can serve as like this digital resume and a digital proof of skills if you've passed certifications or passed Learn modules. Uh, over the years in different organizations. So in Learn, you can select the profile icon at the top. In the top right corner, you can hit settings and then go to account management. And there's a lot more information on Learn about how to do this. It should be pretty easy. Um, if you haven't already noticed too, Microsoft has a new contributor home to go along with your Learn profile. This new contributor home page includes new design with some clear calls for action about how you can contribute to Microsoft Docs, including an FAQ for contributors. It shows off our contributor showcase as well, the blogs I mentioned earlier, uh, for external contributors. And this profile page puts your learn, your certifications, your Q&A, your docs collections, and a lot more all together in one place, including auto detection of your account for um, certification exams, instructor-led training, things like that you have done. And you can get a transcript of all your learn modules, completed exams, historical certifications, and everything with a secure link that you can pass along to potential employers. And you can connect your Pearson View certification profile to get notifications about your certifications renewals and a lot more. And you can link directly to Pearson View to go schedule an exam that you're pursuing. You can check out those links out. Um, there is also, Speaking of everything that I've taught today, if you forget everything that I've told you, there is a whole learn module. In addition to that contributor guide that I mentioned earlier, there's a whole learn module that will walk you through the process of contributing uh, in the learn module format. This was introduced uh, last July, and it's a nine unit learn module that has a knowledge check and some exercises to get you rolling with contributions to open source docs for Microsoft. We estimate this takes about 30 minutes to complete. And it includes GitHub contribution fundamentals, a lot of the GitHub stuff that I talked about today, and including how to edit a published article via the web editor in GitHub.